yeah, we're here. We're alive. We're participating. This is all, these are all good signs. Yes. Um, I missed you guys last week. This is like some of my limited social interactions. So not seeing you guys for all week was like, ah. But um, I'm happy to see those of you who are able to turn on your cameras um, if you're able to. So I wanted to take a little bit of time today to um, dedicate to what we covered last week since we didn't have a chance to meet. Um, but I don't want to like limit that to a particular amount of time. So, uh, cause Buddhism is such a rich tradition. So I want to spend some time focusing on women in Buddhism or Buddhism questions you guys have, and then, um, we'll get to women in Confucianism. But if, uh, that topic bleeds over into next week, that's fine. Cause as you're going to see the tradition or the interaction between Confucianism and Taoism, um, is very lively. They're not um, exclusionary traditions, right? Where you, you know, if you identify as one, you can't identify as the other. So any um, conversation that we're not able to finish about Confucianism today, we will pick up next week. So I just wanted to preface the class with that. Um, but uh, before we dive in, I wanted to check in with everybody and uh, you can use your, uh, your hand, your actual hands and your camera, you can use your reactions, but, uh, Thumbs up, thumbs, is there a thumbs down? Uh, something to indicate how we're feeling about the writing assignment so far. How are we doing? So we've, we're getting ready to submit our, uh, what, story of significance this week? Yes, right? So we hopefully have a sense of our argument or we're working on finalizing our argument. Um, you know, based on the feedback that you get, you might need to, you know, if you make changes, you might need to tweak your de definition section. Um, I'm still grading those, but uh, this week you're just trying to convey to a reader why they should care about this topic, right? So it's not going to be an argumentative section, right? So I know those are all bubbling up inside of you, right? All of the things you want to say to try to persuade someone to to agree with you. That's wonderful. Just hold on to that, right? We're, we're going to try to um, a, appeal to as wide an audience as possible, right? Including in particular, Right. For anything that's persuasive, you want to have in mind those who are most likely to disagree with you. Right. So have them in mind. How could you get them to care about this topic? Right. Someone who may already just disagree with you right off the bat. So, uh, again, indications, thumbs up, thumbs down, check mark, I guess, could mean good. X is bad. Right. How are we feeling about the writing assignment so far? Is that good? Good. If he kind. Okay. All right. Well, that's overall more positive than I would have thought. <laughs> Good. All right. So um, if those of you who are feeling a little unsure about it, that's totally normal. Again, these are all just working drafts, right? So yeah, we're going to, we're, we're, they're not supposed to be perfect yet. And if you think yours is perfect, you're probably, right, missing something, right? They're all, all, uh, all of our reasoning can be improved upon. Um, so yeah. We're, we're working on this and don't feel bad if it's not perfect so far, that's fine. Um, any questions about the course? Are we still feeling good about the other assignments, discussions, quizzes, things like that? As a rule of thumb, you probably want like at least one citation in each section, right? Obviously certain sections are going to require more than that, but um, I would say at least one for your story of significance, right? And so this will depend on how you go about pitching that story, right? So if you are citing statistics, right? Or something like this, obviously, um, or if you are going to uh, even construct your own hypothetical, right? Maybe you want to cite something that's sort of similar in real life to show that it's relevant or something like this. But um, the idea is that anytime we can bolster any assertions we make, right, about things as we think they are, any we're going to want to cite those assertions with some evidence. Okay. Yeah. I would also uh, agree yeah. on that as well. So I know okay. that you all think criticizing each other is terrible and it feels awful doing it, but it's good, <laughs> right? We need it. Nobody is going to, you know, as, as good as it might feel to read a peer review and be like, oh my God, they loved everything. That's not really helpful to you at all, is it? Right? Like that's just, a, you know, just patting yourself on the back. We want that constructive feedback. That's probably the most valuable part of that work. So if you're in there just reaffirming everything they did, you know, that's valuable in the sense that they know what not to take out, but that's pretty much it, right? That doesn't really help you improve it going forward. So really think of that constructive 
criticism as something that is going to be valuable to them, right, that they can use going forward, because the idea is that you might see something that they don't. And in turn, right, we're practicing honing our own skills so that when we assess our own work, we can start to find those missing pieces, right? And so we practice that by assessing other people's work. So I know it feels terrible. That's why I encourage you to do a compliment sandwich if, if you feel bad, right, end on something positive. <laughs> but yeah, that constructive piece is going to be the most valuable. So I know it feels bad but we gotta we gotta get over that <laughs> thank you for asking okay. you bring up a good point about the rubrics right so my instructions are based on general guidelines right because all of your topics are different which is why your specific peer reviews are so valuable right because you're giving them content specific feedback right so it's not just did they do the thing that i asked right but did they do it well given the particular topic that they've chosen, right? So you're getting into the details, the nitty gritty, which is something I can do, I do for you, but often, you know, my feedback comes later, right? Because <laughs> I have to get through a whole class and my feedback is also going to be different. You guys have, you know, different perspectives and you're bringing different things and different lenses to this. So you guys might pick up on things that I don't even, right? And so getting as well-rounded content specific feedback um, as possible is is what we are looking for there. But that's a good point, right? So by instructions, they might have done, you know, checked all the boxes, but that doesn't mean that they did it, you know, perfectly, right? Or did, that they did it as well as they could have done it, right? You can think of like those bare minimum requirements as just that, right? Like, <laughs> like you did the bare minimum, but we want to make our, our positions and our reasoning and our papers as strong as possible. So yeah, both excellent points. Any other questions um, about the class assignments? things like that. We often think, you know, we, we have all this background information in our head when we're writing these ideas down on paper, and we're constantly editing those down, right, to only put down what's necessary, right, obviously, because I am making you keep it within a certain length, <laughs> but, right, there are other reasons to edit down our work to make them concise and clear, but sometimes those missing pieces are necessary to make explicit, right? And so, yeah, sometimes like getting it from that other person's like, oh, well, it's clear to me why those points connect, but it's not clear to someone else. So now I need to go back and maybe add a little bit more detail here. Yes, good, good, wonderful. Yeah, I'm glad these are, it's a, it's a tough process, but I'm, I'm making you all do it because I, I benefited so much from it as a writer when I did it when I was in school. Um, so if I didn't think it worked, I wouldn't make you do it. <laughs> but I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you guys are, are looking at it from so many different perspectives. Good. All right. Any other big class, big picture type stuff? All right, let's bring it into um, Buddhism to start us off. So Buddhism is coming out of which religious tradition? Specific uh, Hinduism. 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 Good, right? So this was the oh. one which feels like a long time ago now. But yeah, so Hinduism, right, obviously branched off given it's the length of time it has been practiced, right? Like any religious tradition, it evolves over time, right? Different religious texts and doctrines are highlighted. These eventually, along with socio-political events, cause religions to fracture into what we call branches, right? So they start to go by different names, right? Um, or start to, again, make explicit some of those differences in, in doctrine or text. Um, and so how, how many, can we remember about how many schools or branches of Hinduism there ended up being? more than that <laughs> but yeah so we yeah like eight or something yeah there's a lot right um and so we can categorize those into the two general camps right the gnostica and the ostica schools and so this is just whether or not they recognize the authority of the vedic texts which were the original the oldest right um considered authorless texts in hinduism Okay, and so Buddhism is going to be one of the schools that falls under which general approach, Astika or Nastika? Or in other words, does it does Buddhism accept the authority of the Vedas or does it reject the authority of the Vedas? Uh, I believe that Buddhism rejected the authority of the Vedas. 
Excellent. They did, right? Along with Jainism is another one of the major traditions, right? Um, there's there's one other one, but it's it's not so large that uh, that you know the major traditions are going to be looking at it. But it's a, a form of um, again sort of immaterialism, right? So we have these metaphysically different commitments to what exists, right? Between Hinduism and Buddhism, right? There's going to be a couple major differences, but one of the biggest ones, right, is that Buddhism is going to deny the existence of certain things that Hinduism claimed to exist, right? So let's give some examples of what those are, maybe in the chat. You, people, we want to type in those um, ideas. What did Buddhism claim did not exist that Hinduism claimed existed? So they definitely rejected the caste system. I mean, they acknowledged that it existed, but they objected to it more morally speaking, right? That it was unethical, good, and the hierarchy, excellent, right? So they ob objected to those, good. What else did Buddhism reject or deny the existence of? Good, so yes, contemporary Buddhism is more theistic. But in its origins, Buddhism is an, a non-theistic religious tradition or an atheistic, right? It does not posit the existence of any form of deity, right? And um, the Buddha himself certainly was not in the origins of the religious tradition considered a god, right? So there are some, again, uh, more contemporary branches that have deified aspects of the Buddha, but that is not the original sort of sentiment of the Buddhist tradition, right? Very strictly, they rejected anything outside of Maya, right? So if we remember that metaphysical sort of picture in, in Hinduism, there were two aspects to reality, right? There's Maya or the illusion that we are living in. And then there was Brahman, the sort of ultimate reality, right? Of which a part resides in us, right? That was your Atman or your Jiva, right? All of that stuff outside of Maya in Buddhism is rejected, right? And that's where the notion of God came from in Hinduism, right? So without Brahman, without Atman, right, we're not going to see that same sort of notion of divinity in Buddhism either, right? So all there is in Buddhism is Maya, right? So we can just sort of eliminate all the other metaphysical commitments of Hinduism is a good way to view it. Right. So we're just dealing with what exists in Maya. So that's samsara, right? The circle of life, death, and rebirth. What else exists in Maya still for Buddhists? Good, karma, right? So we still have this notion of a sort of law of justice of the universe, right? That um, it just sort of the idea is that it, again, sort of balances itself out through cause and effect, right? And the idea, again, is that for positive contributions, right, into the world, right, then the effects would be positive, negative versus negative. And also very similarly as to what we saw in Hinduism, there are going to be different realms of rebirth, right? So we, since we still have the cycle of death and rebirth, and since it is still governed by karma, right? You can be reborn as a greater type of being, right? Or lesser type of being. So we're going to see that carry over just without the social implication in terms of the caste system, right? As we saw in Hinduism. Okay. What else is existing in Maya and Samsara? Karma, we have anything else? Good, so let's talk about the jiva or avidya, right? So the jiva in Hinduism was your personality, right? It's the sort of unique traits that have, that accompany your Atman in this particular embodiment, right? So if you were previously, re, you know, born as a cat or something, right? You would have had a different jiva, cat jiva, right? Cat personality versus your now current human jiva or personality. Is there anything like that in Buddhism? This So if there's no Atman, is there anything like a jiva? 
Nama Rupa, which I'm typing in here. And that is a collection or bundle of traits that every being has, right? And there are five of them, okay? Um, and this is outlined in uh, in the uh, the PowerPoint. They're called the five skandhas, right? But the idea is that unlike the so in Hinduism, you have this Atman, which is a permanent self, right? And then the Jiva sort of like are traits that are bound to it in a life, but then the Jiva changes as the same Atman gets right goes through the cycle. So. How is that different than Buddhism? Well, there's nothing underneath, right? It's just the traits, <laughs> right? But those traits don't get carried over. They dissolve in each lifetime, right? So the difference is that there's nothing being carried over or being reborn. And this is the tricky part of Buddhism, right? How can we have this concept of karma and death and rebirth if there is no permanent self or soul that is being reborn, right? And so what is the answer in Buddhism? What is getting reborn? If it's not your skandhas and there's no Atman or permanent self, what is getting reborn? just your karma. Yep. Just your karma. Okay. So this brings up another important philosophical question, right? That often accompanies Buddhism, which is a question of justice or fairness, right? Because to a lot of people, this strikes one's intuitions as very unfair or unjust, right? Isn't the, isn't the car, isn't karma supposed to be a law of justice in nature, right? And that it seems very unjust to perhaps birth someone into a situation where they are more rewarded or punished, right, or experience more pain and suffering for karma that they did not uh, accumulate, right? It's not their karma because there is no them, right? <laughs> there is no permanent self to which it belongs, right? So the idea is that if you're reborn into a, a lower situation or something with more pain and suffering, the idea is that that isn't really deserved then, right? In the way it is in Hinduism, it's seen as a form of justice, right? That, that this is just the, the result of your actions from a previous life. So there's a story um, that is told in Buddhism. Uh, this is part of what I love about Eastern religions, the very narrative, right? Um, and so there's a story that, that they tell about monkeys throwing coconuts at each other, right? And this is supposed to demonstrate uh, how we can sort of resolve intellectually our discomfort with the idea of this being unfair. All right, so there's two monkeys, right? One monkey is throwing coconuts at another monkey. I think this monkey is meant to represent karma, right? <laughs> so this is the karmic justice coming at you, right? So you're the other monkey getting hit with the coconuts, right? And the idea is I think this is meant to demonstrate that life is unfair a lot of the time, right? And so we could stand there and we could complain about the coconuts being thrown at us, or the monkey throwing the coconut says, you can always move out of the way, right? So the idea is that, you know, yes, there is something perhaps unfair, seemingly about karma, but the point is that we can change our karma, right? And we can change in our current existing form, right? What we do with our given circumstances, right? So just because life is throwing coconuts at you, doesn't mean you have to get hit with the coconuts, I think is the general idea. So, right? You can take that story as you will. Um, so again, whether or not that satisfies you, <laughs> you might still think it's unfair, but that's sort of how they resolve that. Molly. Why is the responsibility on the person being hit with the coconuts? That's an excellent question, right? Um, so this is going to deal with the fact that Part of the metaphysical commitment, and this goes for all Eastern religions, right? So this is going to be Hinduism, Buddhism, and we're going to see it a lot in the Chinese religions we're going to be looking at in the coming weeks, which is that there is a, a very intense focus on accepting that reality is constantly changing, right? And I think that 
is going to underlie every sort of idea of how we can achieve happiness or enlightenment, right? Is that we can't change the nature of that, that chaos, but we can change how we respond to it, right? So given that everything is constantly changing, right? And again, that 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 chaotic temporality of of nature is just going to be such that you cannot always be happy all the time, right? That there's always going to be things that are coming and going, changing, right? And it's our attachment to these things, wanting them to be permanent, that is the cause of our suffering, right? And so that metaphysical commitment of, of change really is going to inform all the other beliefs there, right? Now, if if they had a different view of reality, right? If they thought that life could be changed, well, then maybe they would say we something should be done about the monkey throwing the coconuts, <laughs> right? But given their the their view of the way nature is, right? And you can't change nature, right? That's not within our power. But given the way they think nature is, there's always going to be coconuts coming at you. <laughs> and so the only choice is what we can do, right? That's our that's the only thing that's within our control is how we react to the coconuts. And I, yeah, I like uh, Darwin, that's another way of saying it. Our karma doesn't define who we are now, right? In this current life, it merely sets up the preconditions, right? How we start out. Good. Okay, other questions about Buddhism and their metaphysics or doctrines here? Good, that's what I was gonna get to next. So perfect question. Right, so as we transition into the relevance, right, of these ideas and their impact on women and other marginalized groups, right, this denial of Atman is going to be very significant, right, not just because obviously it creates all these interesting philosophical problems, but because exactly this, how are we meant to understand ourselves, right, because understanding oneself in relation to nature is, a, as we've come to see, is going to be a big part of any religious tradition, right, and how useful it is, and, you know, why these traditions are so long-lasting. They're meant to give us answers, right, to the questions that we have, and one of the biggest questions we have is who are we and how ought we to live, right, and so we have this major contrast between a permanent, enduring self in Hinduism, and this not self, what's that called in Buddhism? Not self. Anatta, very good. Okay, so A at the beginning is like a denial of, right? So this is an, like, it's a variation on anatman, right? So anti-atman, right? Anatta or not self, right? Obviously, it's not to say that there's nothing about you that exists because you have your skandhas, but your skandhas are always changing, right? These are aspects of your personality, including your conscious mind, right? Is probably the one we would tie most to our sense of self. But these things are always changing, right? Your conscious mind is always changing. So there's nothing permanent about the skandhas. There's nothing permanent about yourself. And so that's why they say not self, not no self, right? Because again, there is something that we we call the self, but we're just attaching onto our skandhas, onto our nama rupa, right? And so as Buddhism evolves, right, to try to make sense of this not self, it's I'm going to tell you a narrative that comes from a later version of Buddhism. Um, it actually comes from the Neo-Confucian tradition, right? So this comes a little bit later after the introduction of Confucianism and Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism all merged together. But there's a narrative from here that I think is helpful. And um, that is called the Indra's Net. And so this is a story that is meant to convey how we understand ourselves as empty but not being nothing, right? Because we're something, we're not nothing, right? And so, you know, what is this emptiness meant to convey? And so Indra's net is meant to represent nature, right? As a net, a series of interconnected uh, woven lines, right? Or webs. And um, 
right? Each string is meant to represent the cause and effect relationship between things that exist, right? So at every intersection of the web, there is a diamond, right? And the, each diamond at each intersection is a being, right? So each one of us would be a diamond at an intersection, right? And we're connected to one another in the web through our actions, right? Through the way we interact with each other in the world, like ripple effect, right? Cause and effect, that's the nature of reality, right? A web with diamonds at the intersections. So the story of Indra's net involves sort of a dusting off of the diamond, right? In, in the story, the diamonds are covered with this sort of murky gray dust, and that is meant to represent the confusion of the ego, right? This is what we think our, we are. Right, so I want you to think of maybe something that you have used to define yourself, maybe in your life. Like I identify with this thing, this thing is me or a part of me, but then maybe it changed and maybe you struggled with that, right? Like I no longer identify with this thing. Maybe it was something you liked. Maybe it was something you wanted to be or do, right? But so think of something like that, right? So that's the dust on the diamond, right? The thing that you mistakenly, right? So this goes to that question earlier about Avidya. You were ignorant of, or you mistakenly thought this thing was your identity, right? So I'll, I'll just even use myself, like um, being a teacher, right? Has been very important to me, like a big part of my identity. So maybe the dust on my diamond is the idea that being a teacher is part of who I am. Well, what would that mean if I, something happened such that I had to stop teaching? right? Does that mean I'm no longer who I am, right? Or is that I've lost, you know, that some part of me has died or perished or something like this, right? And so the idea in the story is that nirvana, right? It's not going to be moksha. It's a different notion of enlightenment here because we're not trying to be reabsorbed into Brahman, but nirvana or enlightenment in Buddhism then is merely wiping away the dust, right? Uncovering it. And when you wipe away all the dust, because there are many layers, right? Many things that we think are make up who we are, but if we really get down to it, we would discover that they too are impermanent. So if we wipe away all those layers, and this can take lifetimes, right? Many reincarnations. Eventually, you would get to a diamond. Well, a diamond is clear, right? See-through in a sense, Right, so we're obviously dealing with like polished diamonds here in this narrative, <laughs> but uh, so it's something that is empty in a sense. But when you really polish a diamond, it's not truly empty because within it you see reflected all the other diamonds. Oh, that's a beautiful story. <laughs> so yes, right, you wipe away. So yes, there's an emptiness there. But it's not nothing, right? Because reflected within that emptiness is just the nature of all reality. So I think that's sort of a, a very beautiful, if literary way of understanding this notion of emptiness as not being nothing, right? So you, it's almost, it's everything and nothing <laughs> at the same time, right? Because it's all the things, but we have detached from them, right? And we're merely reflecting them back, right, to the world. So uh, that is sort of their variation on this, right? So no permanent self, but still something that we attach to, right? And so the diamond uh, may be a helpful visual for that. But other questions about Buddhism. I have noticed in my studies <laughs> two sorts of markers uh, that tend to correlate right, correlate to, to a lower status than they had been previously, okay? The first one of those happens when these religions move beyond the individual who originated them, right? Um, and yeah, so in Buddhism, this happens after Siddhartha Gautama passes away, right? And um, in fact, I think over a hundred years later, and you have a series of monks, all men get together, right, and try to sort of institutionalize Buddhism, to which they did very successfully, right, out of which we get the three major schools. Um, but so yeah, we have this, uh, I mean, men is an oversimplification, but it's also not like a group of men, right? Uh, we can rephrase that more charitably as any homogenous group, 
right, <laughs> is probably going to work to the exclusion of those who do not fit the group, right? In this case, it happened to be <laughs> monks excluding, right? Male monks excluding females. Um, the other sort of historical marker is invasion of another group into one's homeland. Um, and that is more of the punching down effect that we've talked about, right? Which is that when certain individuals who have previously occupied position of power, again, that happens to have been men, <laughs> have that power taken away from them, right? Right, when any of us have power taken away from us, right? We tend to try to regain that control over those whom we still have power over, right? So reinforcing it, making it worse, right? Punching down or trying to keep people, right? Trying to maybe make that power more explicit so it can't be taken away, right? These types of things. So uh, those are the two big ones that I've noticed. Um, anyone else have any? I mean, you all are young people of the world. <laughs> Interesting. So I had that conception before I read a really excellent book called The Man Not, which I'm gonna recommend. Um, it's by a uh, philosopher of race, uh, Tommy Curry, and he actually has some remarkable research that demonstrates that men of color have actually treated women, right, and especially women of their own, much more equitably than white men have, right? So this preconception that, right, anyone who is suffering from marginalization is going to take that out on women is not necessarily always the case, right? So... It's an important caveat to this, right? Is because anything we're saying, right, is always going to be a generalization. How what might we might think is implied by those generalizations, right? Because that's not always the case. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Absolutely, right? Because again, you have um, a foreign group coming in, imposing beliefs on another group, and in most cases, making it illegal or you know subject to punishment to retain any sort of identity that you had prior. Um, and I mean, think of any situation in which that might happen to you about anything, right? Regard even not about a religious belief, but any situation where someone else whom you don't know comes in and tells you, you can't believe what you have always believed anymore. And you're gonna be punished if you, if you do. And if you talk about, right? And if you do it out loud or in public. And so it's, it's amazing to me how how many religious traditions have managed to survive that sort of oppression, right? Um, and I mean, this is one of the, you know, as much as I, I tend to get caught up in my own sort of criticism of religion sometimes, and maybe this is one of those moments to recognize its role in keeping people strong, right? So we're gonna see this when we get to Judaism and um, the Murano tradition, right? So. Uh, like especially women, right? So when a religious tradition is outlawed in public, it often ends up moving to the private sphere. And who's in charge of the private sphere? Women, right? So interestingly, in these moments of oppression, while outwardly in society, women are facing more marginalization, they're actually getting more power in the home because that's now the only place that their religious tradition can live. And that's their domain, right? So we have these sort of interesting dynamics and power here that um, you know, hurt groups on the one hand, and yet create different opportunities for power as well. Say that religion, I don't know that I think religiosity, which is the, the word for um, measuring one's level of commitment to a religion. Religiosity is higher amongst women overall. Um, and it tends to be highest around the time that women are of reproductive age, right? So there's a strong correlation between religious belief and the notion of teaching one's children how to be a good person, right? And so religion often becomes very important around childbearing years. But again, I wonder if it's perhaps, you know, if I'm being charitable to the role that religion plays in people's lives, I, I would probably be more inclined to say that it's, it's the, the strength that faith gives women, right? That draws them to it because of their marginalization. Um, so one might think that, you know, as 
this would make sense as to why those who receive a higher education are less likely to be religious is maybe not because religion is or uh, education or higher education is anti-religion but because they need not rely on faith as much right to achieve the things that they want they have access to other tools yeah and that's going to be different for each person right so um every person i would think is going to have I think it's going to be pretty impossible to find any two people who have the exact same set of beliefs about anything, let alone religion, right? There's probably always going to be some degree of variation. Um, and that's going to change also at any given time, right? Um, and also who you're around, right? So maybe in certain groups, it's okay for your grandma to question Catholicism and probably in other places, not so much, right? <laughs> or to voice those. Yeah. Um, so there's going to, I, I tend to think that unless there's something perhaps pathological going on in terms of one's dogmatism or commitment to anything, nobody believes anything 100%. Well, that's pretty much what I like. I don't think anyone is like 100% certain about anything, <laughs> right? I think just given our nature as human beings, there's always like 0 0.001, whatever you can make it the tiniest fraction of doubt, but there's always like we always ask questions. Um, so I have Stella, I have a question here and then I'm going to come to you, Molly. Okay. <laughs> Stella, can you, um, is there often, so do you mean like women who are reinforcing the inequities? Cause that's definitely a problem. Um, we talked about that a little bit when we talked about FGM, right. And FGC female genital circumcision. Was that what you're talking about? Yeah. So this punching down happens between every sort of dynamic, right? So men to other men, women to women, members of LGBT community to other members of LGBT, right? So intergroup dynamics as well as extra group, right? Or uh, intergroup. So um, yeah, I think probably the most obvious example of this unfortunately would be Catholicism, right? And the exclusion of women who have had abortions, who have been divorced, right? Uh, people who are non-binary, people who are not heterosexual, right? So they're... Um, we see members who identify with those same groups excluding similar people, right, um, for those types of ideas. Um, I'm trying to think of an example in Buddhism to tie it back. <laughs> um, but that's sort of difficult because... Well, no, I guess so. so an example would probably be women thinking that other women, so Buddhist women thinking that other Buddhist women weren't strong enough to be maybe take on the ascetic lifestyle, right? So that uh, this is something we saw demonstrated in Hinduism. It's carried over in Buddhism, right, as a one of the many paths to enlightenment, right? Um, although the Buddha himself, right, did, he moved past asceticism, right? Um, that's when he had his moment of enlightenment after starving himself for quite a while, right? Um, so, but yeah, there was a period where, again, maybe even the Buddha himself thought that women couldn't follow him, right? They had to ask a number of times, and then it was finally one of his male disciples who had to ask for the women, right? And that's when he said, yes. Yeah. So there are a couple indicators there, but I think an example for you, Stella, would be Buddhist women, right? S making that claim against other Buddhist women or of any religious tradition, right? Saying that, yeah, uh, maybe you can be a member or a practitioner, but you can't be a leader within it, right? You're not actually capable of the spiritual growth necessary, right? To hold that position of authority, which is basically what one is saying, Right, since those positions are meant to be for those who are further down their spiritual path, right, towards whatever the goal of enlightenment is. And so to say someone's not fit for those positions is to say that they're not capable of achieving that growth or of leading others along that path. This is, I think, one of the hardest things that I, I still struggle with about anything related to like feminism, right? <laughs> is like, how do we balance? the desire to make things better, right, for everyone, with the reality 
that them trying to change their situation for the better might actually make their situation worse, <laughs> right? Because it would cause them to have to forsake perhaps those very immediate forms of safety and security, Molly, that you're referencing, which are real, right? And that's what keeps most, most of us, right? In the cycle, <laughs> right? In the status quo is that we're obviously getting enough from it, right? to keep going, right? And it's perhaps the people who are fighting against it that have just, you know, if they've just had enough, <laughs> right? It's not working enough for them anymore. But for the people who go along to get along, it, it's probably just working enough for them, right? From an evolutionary position, right? Those social interactions, that's what has, that's how most females have been, so you know, that's how we have survived historically, right? It's why, um, you know, the social exclusion that tends to happen amongst female groups is considered, it, it like triggers our lizard brain. Like we literally feel like we're going to die. Yeah. If you were excluded from the group, you did die, <laughs> right? So there, you know, this, this fear, it doesn't come from nowhere. And you're right. Those consequences tend to be much more severe for women, um, you know, immediately what comes to my mind are some of these um, shows about like escaping polygamy um, and uh, what's the other one about the, um, it's like a branch of the Quaker movement, right? And all of these women are trying to leave it or they try. Keep sweet, pray and obey. Oh, that's, that's a good one. Yeah. Uh, and not just the cults, but pretty much any of these very isolated religious traditions, right? Communities that really um, are orthodox and stay, you know, tight in amongst themselves. You know, it's not just going against the religion, it's going against everybody, your family, your friends, your employer, probably, right? So like your whole livelihood is wrapped up. Um, and so it's not, you know, some of us might have the the privilege of being able to question our religious views without risking our jobs <laughs> and our friends and our family. And not everyone is in that position. Yeah. So this is one of my personal fascination with cults is that they employ a lot of the same tactics that we see amongst these very conservative religious groups, right? And it's the exact uh, tactic that you're mentioning, which is that the first so I'm not saying that religious traditions are always doing this intentionally for the same reason, but the effect ends up being very similar. So in the situation of a cult, you have one person who's like intentionally trying to do this, right? So it's much more malicious. But the first thing that they try to do is get their followers to see the outside world as something to be afraid of, right? And then they uh, call it love bombing, right? Creating like this amazingly safe space for them that is a, a shelter, right, from that enemy outside world to be afraid of, right? And so that is a that is a method of psychological manipulation. It's just something that is effective, <laughs> right, in terms of getting humans to do what you want them to do, right? And so it's not surprising that we see similar sorts of effects happen in religious traditions that operate the same way. Again, I'm not trying to ascribe the same malicious intent, but even if that wasn't intended, you often have the same effect because of how it operates on the human person. Like it just, it, we react that way because of the way we have survived historically. Technically, every single religious tradition started off as an occult practice. Occult, right? Just means outside of the mainstream, okay? So all of the major world traditions began as occult practices and then became institutionalized over time. Um, but again, what counts as religion is going to depend on your definition. And we saw a lot of definitions at the beginning. Um, in this day and age, most people don't consider something a religion unless it has some form of institutionalization, right? Some sort of structure um, of consistency that's meant to perpetuate it going forward. And that system um, is not dependent upon one person, right? So even in situations like in Catholicism, right, where you have the Pope, like, you know, there's not just one Pope forever, like that position is always being filled by somebody new, right? It's not gonna, it's not gonna be vacant for long. So you have that institutionalization. That's typically what 
people would use to differentiate nowadays between a newer religion or a cult versus an actual religious tradition. But then you have like legal status, right? Which um, uh, I saw who mentioned Scientology, Stella, yeah. Uh, you know, they were, they went on a campaign uh, to get the IRS to give them tax exempt status, right? So technically, according to the US government, Scientology is a religion, right? Because they were able to get this legal status. Right. So, but again, it depends on how you define it. So again, my distinction would be that cults, not occult, but cults tend to be surrounding a particular individual to whom there is no replacement. And I, I don't want to say too much more than that because I think cults can take many different forms, but they definitely tend to uh, utilize those psychologically manipulative tactics like the one I mentioned before, as well as others um, like uh, keeping people very busy and so um, constantly keeping them exhausted. So under not making sure they're not getting enough sleep, right? So sleep deprivation, um, making sure they're not getting enough food right? So these sorts of tactics make people more susceptible to persuasion, right? It's harder for us to maintain our own sense of self and identity when uh, when we're kept in that sort of state. And so a lot of cults use maybe not the same exact tactics, but psychologically manipulative tactics like that. So I would say, and uh, to, in psychology, they would say that the cult leader would be probably like someone with a uh, not just grandiose, but like maniacal form of narcissism, right, is usually the type of personality, um, but they're also usually very personable, right, so they're very, people are drawn to them, um, so there are, there are psychological elements that tend to describe cult leaders, but I would say anything that where just the person cannot be replaced, it's them or nobody, that's a cult. <laughs> Any definition we give, major religions have done it, I know. No, but so th this is really important. So yeah, there is a sense in which if we frame a cult as anything that is revolved around one particular person or persona, right, and without them, like, all is not. Um, I would say, though, that if we're looking at what, again, I want to take the most charitable understanding of each religion and not it at its worst, right? So even in Christianity, right? Jesus is not everything, right? <laughs> Jesus is the embodiment, the temporary embodiment of God, right? And so it's not really just about Jesus, <laughs> right? Um, so in that sense, I would say that it wouldn't qualify in this way, right? And so similarly, even if you had, right, um, the, those people who have deified the Buddha, right, who have made him godlike, this is actually comes from the way Hinduism views Buddhism, right? They thought that Siddhartha Gautama was just another embodiment of Vishnu, right? <laughs> so, right, we have these sort of temporary embodiments of beings. So it seems like it's surrounding this one person, but typically in institutionalized religions, those people represent the divine right? It's not really the person. Um, Jehovah's Witness. Yeah, so do they, so this, there is some theology that might get tricky here with Christianity, though I, maybe we should save this until we talk about Christianity. I mean, class was over 10 minutes ago. No one stopped us. This conversation is so good. Okay, um, so we're way off track, but this is really good conversation, so I'm going to keep it going. If you have to leave I'll see you next week, and I uh, promise we'll talk about Confucianism. <laughs> um, okay, so the divinity of Christ is a complicated issue in theology, right? Because on the one hand, Christ has to be fully God, right, in order to have the status um, of the Son of God and the Savior, not just another prophet, right? So it's right, placing Jesus as higher than other uh, divinely touched, we shall say, individuals, right, in the Bible and in the uh, Old Testament. Um, yeah, the 
deprogrammers list, that's what mine is sort of coming from. Um, but God also has, to, or Jesus also has to be fully human in the Christian theology because we are supposed to live like he did, right? And if Jesus was only a divine being, well, then no one could do what, you know, we have like, what would Jesus do? Like, you could never do that because, right, we are not gods. And so there's this interesting sort of dilemma that Christian theologians have to deal with that might have some implications depending on how you define a cult, right? But it's going to depend on how you hash out uh, Christ's divinity in that sense. I really want to encourage you all to see those as red flags, um, though if you use that as a definition for a cult, everything is going to be a cult because <laughs> there are lots of, right? I mean, you're going to even have classes where teachers aren't going to let you question. <laughs> and I would be hesitant like to... for making before about the consequences, right? Especially that women have to face. But this was a point that, you know, if we go back to like an intro to philosophy class, you'd learn about Plato's allegory of the cave, right? And the whole point of that narrative is that the philosopher leaves the cave while all the prisoners are in there, you know, fighting over what's not real and not wanting to question their reality, right? The philosopher leaves the cave only to discover that what was in the cave wasn't the most real thing, right? But the philosopher has to go back in the cave. And Plato is very, very clear because of what happened to his teacher Socrates, who was put to death, right? That the philosopher risks their life going back into the cave and asking those questions and especially trying to get other people to ask those questions. It's really dangerous right? And not always just for women, right? But people, sometimes asking questions is a life or death situation, right? And I don't want to underscore that because for some people, that is exactly what it is, right? Again, it's a very privileged position that we're in that we're able to ask these questions, right? Openly and to doubt and, right? So yeah, I encourage you to see those as red flags, but yeah, we have to be charitable to those also who aren't in that position, right? Who can't take those same risks always that we are. Um, but I, I still think we should encourage it, right? Gently. Yeah. Gently. Most of these people who are leaders in the in the whatever institution, they study theology, right? It's not like they're not uninterested in these questions, right? But yeah, it might be the situation in which you ask it. When you ask it in front of the flock, right? It's a little bit more dangerous, a little bit more high stakes, right? <laughs> than if you ask it in a one-on-one -on -one, uh, one -on -one conversation. Yeah. <laughs> that is very new for the Catholic tradition itself to widely embrace. It's something that we've seen in other traditions, right? We see, like I mentioned, Eastern religions are much more inclusive, right? Not exclusionary. You don't have to pick only one, right? Uh, to be an adherent of uh, proselytization proselytization right is viewed very differently um i don't know if any of you are fans of larry david but right he makes the point about how in the jewish tradition you don't try to convert others right he's like let's be like just because i love shrimp i'm not going to force you to eat shrimp right like it's <laughs> sort of he's making right that's the jewish way to make jokes about it but right there are these different ways of approaching all of these things and we're going to see again a vast variety in every religious tradition right so we're making generalizations about christianity it's changing all the time as well, right? Um, and so a lot of people are part of these much more liberal, inclusive, um, less institutionalized forms of Christianity. And it sounds like even Catholicism, which is interesting. Well, the evolution of religious traditions is interesting, right? Like how one branch, you know, thoroughly separates itself and becomes its own thing. Um, I, I think there's probably a lot more social political stuff going on there than than I'm I'm knowledgeable about. <laughs> you know, we learn about like yeah. the Great Schism and like, you know, the Protestant Reformation, but these are like, there's so many different, you know, branches of Christianity now. Those don't really help us <laughs> capture the differences. It's the current book goes back awesome. and forth with, uh, you know, letting people in, not letting people in. Right. What it's a sin, but you're still allowed to. But you're not forgiven. I forget what he's saying about members of the LGBT community now. It's I, <laughs> good. You know, okay. Because it's not even Catholicism. You know, Catholicism is waning in popularity. It's it's really struggling to find adherence. It's the American evangelical tradition. Um, and it has moved beyond the Americas. And uh, you know, there's this sort of they call it the prosperity gospel right, is the idea, uh, the new sort of Christian version of karma, 
Um, but it's very not not in line with Jesus's teachings. Like it's very anti-Christian um, if you are looking to Jesus as the exemplar. Um, so yeah, right. As traditions evolve, they can they can depart greatly, right, from what the original teachings were, and that can cause a lot of problems. But then to deal with them again, right? Where do we go? Do we go back? Do we leave? Do we change it? It's 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 very complicated. I, I do want to be sensitive to everyone's time. It's so nice that you all have stayed. Uh, anyone else have any any other questions or things you wanted to discuss?